first of all, my background is it, obviously it's different to yours. Um, I was always interested in like weights and exercise and what have you. And uh, I think uh, when I was about nine, my mum's friend, uh, he he made he was a metal worker and he made me uh, a pair of dumbbells, which were basically an iron bar, not like the stuff you're doing, man. Like yeah, machine, yeah, yeah, yeah. Machine to like nano millimeters of what have you, you know. But it was weight. It was weight. It was a bar and it was like two tin cans filled with lead shot at each okay. end. So it's like a tin can at each end filled and then sealed. You know, two green, but they were painted green, luminous green for some reason. They're probably radioactive. So that's probably why I haven't got any hair now. That's why you so, have no uh, hair. But the then, selfie you, light reflects nice. It, well, exactly. Yeah, 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 that's like, that's like, well, it's the halo. It's, it's yeah, reflection yeah, yeah. Of the, halo. the halo. So, um, yeah, so I was always interested in exercise. I've always been interested in exercise. And obviously that was realized. So I was uh, made these weights. And then a few years later, when I was about 13 or 14, my dad, uh, we went to the shop and my dad bought me some weights. Now, I know those weights couldn't have been very much because I, I walked out the shop carrying the whole set. So they probably weren't very whatever. But uh, so at 14, I was started getting into weights and everything. And I also had like a little neck thing, neck worker, a wrist roll up bar, right. metal shoes, metal shoes, sort of things I don't really use now. You know, stuff and this like is that. all at, this is all at home. This is all at home in the seventies and everything. Okay. I used to do like preacher curls over, you know, Scott curls over my mum's banisters. I used to do chin ups on my mum's banisters. I used to do pullovers lying on my bed, with my feet between the wall and the bed, you know, in in a in a, a forlorn attempt to expand my uh, sparrow like rib cage, you know. So <laughs> I was doing that, you know, and then I was doing pullovers and then doing a set of squats and then a, a set of pullovers, and then I also started finding because I was interested in fitness you know and health a diet as well so i was you know trying out diet eating lots of meat having a, a dozen eggs a day this is just literally when i was 14 or 15 uh, 10 what, grams, what, what were, this is interesting to me because i this always was, yeah what, what were you trying to achieve at that point you, it was just uh, fun I, was, I think i was trying to become like one of the comic book heroes i saw yeah. you know quicksilver uh black panther spider-man silver surfer because i was Got fascinated it. by athleticism by movement by power you know that superhero thing but i was interested you know in strength and quickness and you know all those sort of things and also i was like raised watching tarzan films and tarzan what have you and i had this idea that i was like one of these you know uh jungle people running through the jungle you know nimble agile so that's always been part of my psyche what i didn't realize because i, I didn't live with my dad is that he was exactly the same when he was a kid I so see. even though he had, uh, he bought me a set of weights. So he sort of realized, you know, that side. But this is the thing about nature and nurture. You know, that was in me. I'm, I'm, that was complete because it wasn't in my environment on my mum's right. side. And it wasn't in my, my sister's side, but it was in me. Right. Uh, so I was always interested in health, exercise, being able to climb, being able to jump over things and stuff like that. Anyway, and so I, I wasn't always into competitive athletics because I only started competitive athletics when about 27, 28. Right. Uh, and then I started doing 800 meters. So for all of my 30s, I trained for 800 meters. Um, so a little which, late, though, to the competitive athletics. It was very late because I was yeah. always exercising, but I was never in competition. But I kept fit all the way through. Right. You know, I, I had a couple of races. I had a civil service 10K race, which I won in South London and everything. There were only about like 70 of us. But I got into the local newspaper because I won a local 10K, you know, and it was a civil service thing and so what have you. So I was like a local civil service champion 10K for a while. Uh, and you would look at me and think, well, you're an ectomorph, you know, what have you got good endurance, therefore you're a long distance runner. But it's very difficult to tell just from the morphology of person, you know, from the outward thing, what, what they are. Uh, but I like the idea of being able to run fast, you know, not just right. run distance, run fast. So I don't always exercise. And then someone said to me when I was like 27, said, why didn't you go down the track? Because, you know, uh, you're good at what you do. And why don't you join a group? So I decided to do that. Uh, and then I joined an 800 meter group. I just sort of fell into it. So from my 30s, I trained for 800 meters. And the thing about 800 meters is you're neither the fastest nor the strongest. What you 800 meters is an intersection of things. You need a good aerobic base. You right. know, a, above 65, 66 VO2 max, you need uh, good basic speed. So around about 11 flat for 100 meters. 
This is if you want to be a good 800 meter runner. So this is what I had. Uh, plus you need an excellent ability to tolerate or buffer acidosis. Right. When you produce lactic acid, it dissociates into lactate and hydrogen ions. And the hydrogen ions lower your pH, so they acidify your blood and your right. cells. So you need to develop the ability to tolerate and buffer hydrogen ions, which is acidosis. So 800 meters is the intersection of, of um, uh, aerobic capacity, anaerobic capacity, basic speed, and uh, um, tolerance to acidosis. And at this point, were you already, when you started competing in your late 20s, 30s, is this when you started training for strength more? I know you said you were uh, training for strength as a yeah, kid. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. I was always training yeah. for strength, but just naturally. You know, I wasn't trained right. to maximize a deadlift or a squat or, uh, you know, I mean, in fact, I didn't really have the facilities when I was a teenager for a squat. So I was doing like sissy squats. I was doing right. air squats. I was doing one-legged squats and, you know, stuff like that squat jumps and running up the stairs and stuff like that. Uh, it was only later on, but I actually got more into cycling when I was 20 because I was doing a fair amount of cycling. I started doing squats proper. And then I realized that squats boosted my ability to cycle up a hill within a few weeks. It was incredible. Right. It was right. literally I was going on, going uphill after squatting for a couple of months was basically like going on the flat. That's right. how the transition was so profound. And I realized then, the ability for squats too. And we'll discuss that later on because there's a lot of nonsense talk about power and specific training and all the rest of it. Uh, and really what people should do is increase their general strength because basically their specific strength is just a further mining of general strength. Exactly. You know, uh, what have you. So, so yeah, so then I went into 800 meters. So my strength training, uh, training was embedded in an 800 meter schedule. It wasn't pure strength training as such. It was right. embedded in the middle distance training. And the reason it could only be embedded is because you could say, yeah, but you mean because I had other things to do. Circuits, hills, intervals, lactic training, longer runs. So there's no way I could focus purely on strength. Right. So it's all embedded in producing a I mean, you get stronger is always better. But, of course. Yeah. Uh, you've got to run as an 800 meter runner. Right. So, as a, as a human being, you've got an energetic envelope. You've only got so much energy, so you have to do what gives you most bang for your buck. Uh, and you've only got so much uh, recovery capability. That's, you know, the even, biggest part. That's the biggest part. When, when you're talking to an athlete, and we talked about the other day about the two-factor model. And what people don't understand, a lot of the questions they ask, hey, I'm doing you know squatting three times a week and deadlifting, but I'm also doing jujitsu, or I'm also doing this, or I'm also doing that. And what they don't understand is that's fine, but the yeah. recovery amount is finite, right? Yeah. So when you, when it, yeah. what is the goal for you? It's the 800 meter, you know, for me, if it's the squat at the time or whatever it is, you have to decide where do I want to channel that recovery or how much do I want to allow it to happen instead of doing another stressor. Yeah. Uh, this is where I think like coaching and what have you, you know, sport, I've got a sports science degree. Okay. And that's just like an entry level. Really. Yeah. yeah, and yeah. I follow a few uh, sports scientists on uh, Twitter. Um, but coaching in itself isn't really, well, it's a science, yeah, but it's also an art. Totally. Uh, and I think that's the thing. It is an art because you've got to balance so many things and what may work for someone else. And also, for instance, I mean, I remember a fellow saying to me at the uh, gym years ago, I was at a, a, a local gym and he, he came, he, he could see I knew what I was doing and I looked a certain way and what have you. And he said to me, do you know what? I'm doing squats. I'm doing this. But I'm not progressing, and I'm, you know, I'm doing everything right. I'm taking more. I'm taking a mass gainer, taking protein powder, blah right. blah blah. And then I said, well, you know, it sounds like you're doing the right thing, okay. Uh, and he, I said, I don't really know. You just have to carry on. Make sure you recover. And he said, yeah, but it's just when I do a set of squats, it takes me like five days to recover. And he was only in his twenties, so I was thinking, okay, well, something's wrong here. Yeah. And in passing, just before the, the end of the conversation, just before the end, he said, oh, by the way, I work shifts, so I only get about four and a half hours a night sleep i thought well there you go there it okay, is that's the recovery so what it is is that there's so many components that go into producing a performance or for what have you that and the way your body naturally deals with those different things that you've literally got it's multi-dimensional you could probably look at 50 different things and you've got to balance all of those things but even if you get 49 right not having enough sleep will just eventually they'll explode this yeah, is the, so the, the, the sleep part of recovery is probably the most important thing. And this is what I talked about, you know, when people want to lose weight or they want to diet, people, 
people use in the weight room, and it's, it's probably different for the 800 meter guys or guys that have to keep the body weight down, but I, I, it drives me insane in the weight room where they just use the kitchen as the recovery method, right? Yeah. And so instead of optimizing the other things, hey, let me, how's my sleep? What's my alcohol intake? What are my stress levels? You know, it's just, hey, just jam it down with food to make the yeah. number go up. And it works, but like, you know, yeah, it's, it's the easiest way out to recovery. Yeah, it doesn't mean there's all these recovery, uh, you know, ways you can recover, you know, whether it's massage, sauna, certain, fight, you know, chemicals, uh, uh, you know, hydrotherapy, uh, re just recovery off of your sport or tempo runs and right. all these sort of things and sleep as well. So sleep is just, it's a major part of recovery, full stop. Okay, yep. and then there's all these other components. So when I say you only have a finite, finite recovery capability, that's if you, you know, you have to mine you know, if you're a competitive athlete, you have to mine those as much as possible. Right. Uh, before you can say, I can't recover. So, you know, and then it's, you know, you need to recover from a certain load. And if you put up the load 50%, then you're never going to recover. Okay. Because right. I could, you know, so could you and I could produce a schedule that in 14 days would probably kill a rhino. Right. No matter what your recovery is. Okay, because I've seen some like big session weight things in muscle magazines for centuries, you know, for like decades. And uh, it seems like centuries. And um, <laughs> I've tried them out on myself. And I thought, wow, there's no way you can survive off of this unless you're so genetically superior that you can put up with this load. Because part of being an elite athlete isn't just that you can progress because you adapt, but it's also your tolerance to injury. And it's your tolerance. To, so you could be a great athlete, but you may have a tendency to get injured. Right. So it means, so you need to be, all those factors Factors need to be in there for you to be able to, you know, produce them. It's a, it's a fascinating. So this is why I say coaching is like an art more than a science, you know? Well, yeah, and I think, no, I agree. And I think this is one of the things I see, you know, we talk law diminishing returns all the time in terms of you get someone, they're detrained, they need general strength. You start training them big barbell exercises, adding a little bit of weight, boom, they're getting stronger, stronger, stronger. What happens? They go on vacation, they get sick, they do something, they don't, they don't lift for a few weeks, they come back, they reset, right? And they're constantly doing this thing. And they complain to me, you know, hey, how are you able to like take this time off and then still come in and deadlift this amount of weight? Or how are you able to do this? And it's sure there's, there's adaptation workout to workout, very, for sure, the session to session. What people don't understand is over time at a macro level, when you zoom out, right? Your ability to do those rhinoceros workouts and the work capacity happens because for years, right, you're attempting to add more weight to the bar. And maybe not every session it's going up, but the structural adaptations that are happening to the body, you know, I worked out the least amount I've ever worked out since I was probably 15 in 2020. I had a lot of shit going on, right? And so it's probably the fewest workouts. I did Done very well, sessions. yeah. Yeah, I did two sessions a yeah. week instead of four, right? I usually do four. I went down to two sessions. And I just said, hey, I'm going to maintain, you know, my overall strength. And so I was able to do that, but it's because the work was put in beforehand, right? Strength, slow to gain, kind of, you know, b real big strength, but very slow to lose. What's up? That's an interesting point. How long do you think, how long do you think that lag effect keeps going that you could only do two sessions a week and it wouldn't stop, then you wouldn't hit the buffers as far as progress is concerned. So you yeah. can keep that up for a season or a year yep. and perhaps no more or what? I think right now I need to get, and I've started my ass back in the weight room, seriously training. Because basically what I've been doing is coming in, doing two sessions. Hey, I'm going to squat five by five. I'm going to press five by five, you know, 80, 90% maintenance and then the other session i'm on a bench and i'm on a deadlift and i'm very active though right also doing a bunch of physical labor boxing up weights you know all that stuff which i wasn't yeah. doing before yeah. you know came into it yeah. um but i've i've realized now you know so what happened hey six months in let me go see if i can still pull 500 can still pull 500 you know six months in let me go see if i can still press 250 can still press 250 yesterday i went to press 225 and it was like an all-out struggle right it took me like five six seconds so you know, I even think, with the hip thingamajig. Even with the hip thingamajig. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All presses for me are with the hip thing. <laughs> uh, but no, so I think, you know, it's 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 similar to the aging population. This is why I, I go to train the aging population as hard as possible when I get them. And I and I say that I'll, I'll clarify. But what I mean is when a, when a guy like you hits 60, you're different. You're athletic or an athlete and been training your entire life. Right. 
But I take my dad, get him lifting at 64. He can't squat the bar to death, right? He can't bench press 70 pounds. Runner his whole life, you know, decent body weight and stuff. But when he started doing it, he couldn't do it. So I was just talking to him the other day. It squats up to 240. And he's like, yeah, you know, I think it's enough. And I said, no. I said, you got to get it up even more. I said, because dad, when you hit 70 or so, you're going to be trying to keep weight on the bar. And it's going to be coming off. Yeah. This is nature, right? You're going to be getting it. I was like, so right now, while you can still make progress, yeah. you have to so that when you're older, you can keep weight on the bar so you can keep doing the stuff you want to do, right? Yeah. And not deteriorate. And so, you know, I think that's where older people, if they've never trained, you know, it's like, oh, well, I'll just like take it light and take it easy. And I don't know what the point is. And I don't, for the lag effect for me, I don't know what it is. But at some point, I see it all the time. We have a lot of people we help over 70. All of a sudden, boom, they just start deteriorating, right? And so it's, 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 it's getting, building the strength so that when those days come, you know, you're just trying to, as Rip likes to say, you're trying to stave off death. Yeah. 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 Uh, that's an important point. Now, as I said earlier, you know, like a few months away from being 60, which I don't understand. I don't know how that's happened. But you know, How is it possible? Uh, it's not possible. I think it's yeah. peculiar just to me because it's, it's not possible. Um, there is a couple of things. Some things I know uh, that I can only maintain. OK, uh, because my recovery capability is uh, reduced. Uh, plus, there's other things perhaps I was bothered about, which I wasn't so much bothered about in my 800, you know, when I was doing 800 meters. Um, so I'm sort of, I, what I am, I've got like this pyramid, you know, things I want to be able to do still. Uh, but there was also the base, there's also the top of the pyramid, which is keeping up my muscle mass, my amount of muscle mass relative to me. It's not the right. same as yours. Right, right, right. Uh, and keeping up the strength as well. Uh, for me, absolute strength is obviously important, uh, but it's also coupled with, you know, keeping my relative strength uh, going. Uh, and uh, Relative so strength your, as in? Uh, you know, deadlifting a certain amount of your body weight, being able to do Got so it. many chin-ups, you know, moving your body in, through right. the environment, you know, and being able to do repeat, repeat, one-off absolute things. But uh, for instance, you know, if I um, uh, squat, say, 600 pounds, I'm squatting... I don't know how much is that. I mean, I'm I'm a lightweight, so I'm like 150 yeah, yeah. pounds. I'm a 10 More stone. Yeah. Do you know stone over in the US? Because I know. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so I'm like 10 and a half stone. So if I'm squatting what you're squatting, it represents a greater, you know, relative what of, course, of, yeah. um, of body weight. So I can't do that, you know, in, in that sense. Um, but um, so yeah, it's a challenge. This is the thing about training. As you age, and as when you have children, when you have a business, when you have a the dynamic changes, you know, you've oh, got yeah. to juggle all of these different things. If you, well, there's two things. If if you were just training, you could just concentrate on that. That's fine. But it would be a hell of a boring life if that's all you did. Totally, totally. You know? I mean, a professional athlete's career is basically based around training all the time. Training. You know, when you're young, yeah. you're in your 20s, what have you, you can do that. So it's that single point focus, which of course is what you need. Right. Uh, but the outside life eventually, you know, is going to come in, in pinches on that, you know, in, in what well, is good. You know, when you get older, yeah, yeah. That's, that's a good thing, because for me, 800 meter training. And then when I went down to sprints of 40, well, I had a love hate relationship with 800 meters because I realized that I couldn't go on like a mountain trek. You right. know, or I couldn't do other things that some friends might be doing, like play a game of football on Sunday. Right. You know, Because I thought, no, I can't do that because that's affecting my 800 meters. And if I get injured from twisting and turning, I'm not going to do it. You know, right. I always used to like doing challenges, like I say in gang, like jumping off walls, climbing things. Stuff. But I remember once we were at the coast and my friend jumped off like, uh, I don't know, a 15 foot wall or something onto like flat sand. And I was going to do it. And I thought, oh, perhaps I shouldn't do it. Because if I twist my ankle, my 800 meter run, running is going to be affected. Right. Right. And so and then I thought, so actually, when I stopped competitive training, it was almost like a release. I could literally do everything else that I wanted to do. Go on 130 mile cycles, go on a trek, do all sorts of challenges, which I couldn't really do before as a competitive athlete. I mean, the competitive athlete is particularly when you're doing something so specific, like an 800 meter sprint or a one rep max, you know, deadlift. It, it, the training has to be specific, but this is the point that I make to people all the time. 
and, and you know, people say, oh, like, oh, you have oh, so much time. All you care about is more weight in the bar and doing stuff in the weight room. And I, sure, there was a time when I was competing and not at your level, right? Just recreational competing, but where, where you're, you're focused on that. But like now I train in here and what I tell people, I was like, you're training for general strength so that when you're in the environment, you can do whatever. Hey, so-and-so wants me to hike Mount Baldy this Saturday, but I know I have heavy squats on Monday. Go hike, man. Like we're not, you know, the, the strength is so that you can do and enjoy those kinds of things. And uh, no, I think that's, that's a good point. And for the, for the general strength training, it's and back to like relative strength. You know, when someone comes in here, I just shoot them straight. I say most of the time, because by the time someone, it switches in their brain that I need a coach, I need a professional, right? Someone that's not an athlete. That means that they are detrained almost every single time. No one walks in here, says, I deadlifted 500 pounds. Look, at, I got a six pack ag like guru. Here's my hot girlfriend. No, it's the guy that comes in and he's like, I work in IT. You know, I've lost all my muscle mass or some guy that comes in with back pain, you know, whatever the case is. And by the time they reach that, they're detrained. And so what I tell them is, hey, look, let's get you to where you're not pathetic. That's generally the words I use. I say, you've got to be able to squat your body weight for five. That's that's being not pathetic. And then once while we're focusing on getting your strength up so that you're no longer sick, this is all you're going to do. And then this is where I probably am a little bit different from starting strength, right? Rip just cares about absolute strength from now until eternity. For me at some point, once someone gets no longer pathetic, hey, we're still working to get you stronger, but what's the size of your midsection, right? Like, are you overweight? You know, you have to start doing, focusing on all these aspects of health, which general strength will do about 90% of those, but you have to make sure that people are monitoring all these things outside of just weight on the bar, in, yeah. in my opinion. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, I mean, there's so many things to talk about. I could literally, you know, we could probably talk, about, you know, a whole day about various aspects of training and health and exercise and what have you. Is, you know, it, it, uh, um, so it, it can't really be, as far as I'm concerned, can't really be compressed into an hour or so. But there were. Uh, I, I, we'll I, have to I do it a say, few times. Yeah. Well. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, yeah. And perhaps concentrate on a particular aspect, perhaps, and yeah. then we could do a series of things. And uh, when I was then, and so I was going to say, so then I spent my thirties. Uh, training for 800 meters and when I turned 40 I thought okay I've had enough of 800 meters and then I had a choice because in running I don't know if you know but the the saying is that as you get older you go up in distance okay, okay. because you retain your endurance but you leave but you lose your speed okay but that's like a self-fulfilling oh, got prophecy. it got it yeah I see yeah that's saying. a self-fulfilling prophecy okay because right. you do but that's because people train that way and I looked at the older like the the masters you know over 40 over 50 over 60 who were endurance runners and I thought I don't like look I'm I don't like what i'm looking at which are basically very stiff sarcopenic looking athletes right you know uh who basically were suffering from oxidative damage and just looked like the, you know the um, the uh, cover of an iron maiden album you know that weird <laughs> yeah yeah you see and death I, thought, in I don't want to look like that yeah i don't yeah. want to look like that uh and i still had a fair you know clip of speed and everything so i thought okay when i'm 40 rather than garbage distance i'll go down to 60 meter indoors 100 and 200 meters so then i started because a lot of my 800 meter training was done on my own because I, I didn't need any motivation i didn't right. I've always had internal motivation and i did right. train with people but i had no problem training on my own and pushing myself on my own uh what have you and then 40 i hang out i hung out with a crowd on my local track and local club who were like 400 meter hurdlers who were sprinters you know, people who were just doing gym and stuff like that. And for me, I literally found my right environment. Okay, as far as that, you know, existential thing, as far as, so it's with athletes who are stronger, who are faster. And I thought that's where I want to go because I realized at 40, even though I couldn't express it in the way I express it now, that I was in a sort of, not a race, but I was in, you know, the, I was had to then counter the aging uh disaster that we all right, face. Right, right, right. You know, I it's not, you know, and so I thought, okay, so I need to put on a few more pounds, need to get a bit stronger, need to go down in distance. And that really suited me psychologically. It's only later on when my dad came around, I showed that I actually, you know, he was a good runner in his island. He was like top boxer and Mauritius and stuff. And then he told me that my my um uh cousin who I'd never met was like an Olympic 400 and 100 meter, 110 oh, really? meter. Oh, really? Yeah, it was like wow. world, it's almost like, it's almost, like it's, world. it's almost like it's in the yeah. gene pool. Crazy. Yeah, and I didn't, I, I didn't realize it until I was like, you know, thirty something. He showed me a picture. I said, "Who's that?" He said, "That's your cousin," and that, he was in the Olympics. So he went to the Barcelona Olympics and the Atlanta Olympics, and I didn't oh, wow. realize that. 
It's yeah, like, why yeah. the fuck didn't you tell me this before? You know, it's like, what? <laughs> Perhaps I would have started earlier. And then he told me all stories about him winning this and winning that and doing this and doing that. But he hadn't told me when I was young. So it's like, okay, perhaps I would have started it earlier. I don't know, but whatever. Right, right. So then all through my 40s, I did. And I realized when I was 40, I was basically one of the fastest 40 year olds in the country. So I thought, okay, I'll carry on and do that. And then I trained all the way through. So, uh, and then by 50, I think I ran like 12 1 for 100 meters when I was 50 for 100 meters. And uh, I was like 20 in the world or something. At 50. Uh, for people my age, yeah. But yeah. the problem is in 50, it's not, it's nowhere like training when you're 20. Right. This is what some of the Twitter bro, bros, you know, are in their 20s. They really don't realize what it's like. They, they say I'm, they do, I'm, I'm, really I'm, I'm, I'm learning this right now, right? So mid 30s yeah. now, and I've started training. I mean, I started messing around at 15, but I started training with weights, you know, at 18. When I got into college, I started really, you know, doing training programs, was doing it wrong. But the difference, the difference in 10 years, like uh, 10 years ago, you know, I'd squat 405, five by five. And two days later, I'd be ready for, you know, a top single at, you know, in the upper fours. Now it's, I can do 405, five by five, but I'm wrecked for, you know, six, seven days, right? The recovery yeah. thing. And I, I'm interested in to see how it goes or, or joints hurt, hurt more, or I have to make sure that, you know, my sleep and the stuff we already talked about is better. And I, it, this is why I've been talking to my father about his training so much. And obviously I talk to older people in the gyms, but I can really ask him, you know, how is this feeling? How is that feeling? And it's, uh, yeah, I'm scared. I hope I'm never turned 59. <laughs> you, you don't have to just lie about your age forever. Yeah, just lie you know, about your age you'll forever. You'll probably be able to get through. You'll be able to get through. You know, when you're 69, you'll still be able to say you're 59, and people believe That's right. you. When you're That's 80, right. when you say you're 59, back people will start suspecting <laughs> you. So, uh, so, uh, so, yeah. Well, I was going to ask you when you talked about starting to strength train to increase your speed. What was the what was the heaviest you got? Uh, not weight on the bar, but body weight. What, what, where have you lived oh, in that man. range? It wasn't really that much. As you know, I'm an ectomorph, yeah, and I've got yeah. light body weight. So I suppose I put on about, uh, about 10, 8, 7, 8, 9% more body weight okay. uh, when I went down to sprints. So, but, that, but as a body weight of 150, you know, or 145, that's not very much. You know, right, so I'm right. still a lightweight. Whatever I'll be, I'll still be a lightweight. I can put on uh, more muscle. I, if I just concentrated on putting on more muscle now, perhaps I can sure. increase my body weight by 5% or something. I right. don't know, whatever. Uh, but I'm also an ectomorph, so I keep the fat off, but muscle doesn't come easy. Right. So that's why I know I have to keep up my muscle mass, because right, it doesn't right. come easy. And right. it goes easy. So I do need to be consistent and do strength work. Not just strength work, but hypertrophy work as well in the gym. I need to keep my muscle mass off. Because I'm right. not a mesomorph and I'm not an endomorph. I know some people say, well, all that somatotype stuff is all old hat. But it, it, it's very, it's, it's still, I'm thin bone, you know, right. so I need to keep up my muscle mass. But well, would you, would you think if, you know, with progressive, uh, you believe resistance training increases bone density, right? Well, uh, uh, a non-weight bearing exercise is, you know, uh, whether it's uh, uh, weight training or running on everything increases bone density. Um, you know, I, I also, you know, I think weight bearing exercise also increases bone in density because your muscles are pulling on your bone, you know, by the ligaments right. and tendons and everything. So all of it increases your bone density. But, um, but yeah, um, but yeah, as I say, you know, the aging disaster is a thing which you've got to stave off as much as possible the I, I think what i've learned over uh you know 45 years of exercise and then 20 years or so of competitive training is there's a few main uh tenets which i would stick by and they're not necessarily do this exercise okay and the main the sort of main tenets are, oh, I've got three main ones, which I've written in my notes, but I'll put them up to my head. First one is consistency. Yep. Consist you may have had the most brilliant session that you think, or exercise regimen that you think is like wha wonderful, you know, it, whatever. If you don't stick to it, it doesn't mean anything. So I'd rather stick to something which is reasonably good than binge something which is fantastic and then not do anything for six months. So the first thing is consistency. It's just Agree, hundred percent. Just keep active, 
you know, keep fit, look after yourself. Consistency is king. Yeah, that's, yes. the, that's the most, you can have, the, as I say, the most perfect training session ever. But if you don't do it, it doesn't matter. It doesn't, mean right, it doesn't matter. Yeah, it doesn't it matter. It's right, yeah. squat, you know, pardon the pun. Uh, so that's the first thing, it's consistency. And then I would say the uh, second thing is, uh, which sort of relates to consistency as well, is that any activity is better than no activity. Sure. You know, so in a sense, Rip has said this, and it says it started straight, that you have a novice effect. Okay, so if you're new to something, anything you do is going to be riding, better. Riding a bicycle increases your bench nothing. press. Yep. Yeah, it yep. doesn't mean that that's the right thing. For, because, you know, basically when you're a novice, you look at a barbell, you put on a bit of strength. Right. Yeah, no, that's totally. how it is. Yeah. You know, you, you lift a pencil and you build a bit of muscle because you're a novice. So there's no point equating what a novice does, you know, and what affected. You see that online all the time as well. People saying, oh, I did this and my strength went up. Yeah, of course it did, because you basically weren't doing did. anything before. Exactly. This goes back to what you were saying, Grant, about when someone says, I've got this specific problem. I, I'm a little bit, um, I know I could do personal training online and personal training, but it's really difficult because I don't know that individual. I don't this know is... where they are in their life, their training thing. What problems they've got to so say, oh, how can I run faster? Or how can I get stronger? I hate doing that because for two reasons. One is I don't know their hinterland. I don't know yep. their background. Two is when you tell them something, they'll look at it as gospel. And the okay. only thing. And it's like, but you know, as you go through training, that there's all these different aspects and nuances. You can and say, let's... oh, increase your, and then they look at it. And then a year later say, yeah, but you said do this. But right. well, so I don't like to be like really prescriptive. You know, right. I find it difficult. To make sure people. we get back to make sure we get back to the third tenant. But what I want to say yeah. on that is because people ask me all the time on Twitter, you know, why is this this? Why is this that? And I always say first, like, hey, if you want to ask me a question, show me a video, because then I at least get some feedback of what's happening. Plus, like now your ass is on the line a little bit like you care enough to put it on there. But what this is why, you know, with starting strength or, you know, general strength training is so important is for, and where people miss it. What we're saying is for most people, like most of the population is detrained. Hey, yeah, add five pounds each time. And they say, well, I got stuck here. Well, I don't know. Were you training three days a week? Yeah, who knows? Like, were you doing Like, I have no idea. And then like, what happens beyond that? No idea. I have back to the consistency is king. Uh, I have a gal in London I'm coaching right now and I'm doing something with her press that I've never done before. She hasn't missed a single session since October. We do it live uh, just like this. And I said, I don't, you know, as we're going, she's like, what's next? I'm like, I'm not sure yet. I got to see like how you, how you recover this certain lift or how does the thing of a jig work for you? Maybe it doesn't, you know? And so over time and then, and then, you know, people on Twitter see her pin pressing. They're like, should I be pin pressing? Well, I don't know. Her press was stuck right here. And so we're training that part of the lockout, you know, and it, it's so, um, yeah. And what you said about everyone taking it as gospel, but you said, and it's like, well, that could be for a particular instance. And, and but this is where I get frustrated with people. Cause I say, have you done the basic thing? Have you gotten the basic stuff out of the way? Are you going in and squatting three times a week? Have you actually added weight to the bar? Cause I find everyone that does this style of training on their own, what do they do? They go in, they start super light because they're nervous. That's fine. They start adding weight. And what happens? It gets hard. So what do they do? Oh, I'm just going to stay here. I'm just going to stay here. I'm stuck. You're not stuck. You're not stuck. You haven't written it down, had the fear of God in your life that it wouldn't come up and then wrote it to the pins. You decided that looks hard. I'm not going to do it. Right. And that's the part that, you know, is. Yeah. Anyway, I digress. Back to your three tenets. Consistency is king. Something's better than nothing. Yeah. And also N equals one. You're an experiment of one, uh, you know, and you only you can only really know after you've had a lot of years in in training, whether it's strength training or athletic training or whatever it is, or throwing darts, is that you're an experiment of one. We have certain base things, you know. There's certain there's physics and there's biology and there's right. metabolism. You know that, so we all exist within that. We all breathe oxygen. We all drink water. But within that, there's so many nuances. And as I say, I'm an ectomorph. So certain things, and perhaps, you know, I need to work more on my carbs, whereas another guy has big carbs, strong carbs already. You know, so you're, there's nature and nurture. So those are the three main. So the, the third one is you have to experiment 
without being a headless chicken. OK, so you try things out, but you're not a dilettante that you do this for a week and you do that for a week and you do this for a week. And my mate said this, so I'm doing that. OK, but you do have to try things out over time. Okay? Of course. You not be headless in the sense you're just trying different routines every other week. You know, so you're an experiment. I mean, we see, we see that all the time, right? People all the time, they, they get on a program and they're doing it. And then boom, the new the new thing of men's health or muscle and fitness comes out, or someone drops a new ebook and it's you know this for that, and they they jump over here and it, yeah, it has to be. This is why for me, it's always collecting data, always yeah. collecting data. And when I train people, I say write down write down how you slept last night in your logbook, write down how much you weigh right now, write down you know your your uh, waist measurement, right? Because all of this data feeds later. I, my logbook from 2020. I mean, I haven't even gone in and analyzed, but I'm really curious to see what you said. What's the lag effect? If, you're, if you've gotten strong, right? There's always someone stronger. But if you've gotten strong, what's the minimum you can do to maintain it? Or what's the speed at which you decline? And all of these things, you know, it has to be measured and focused. And this is why, this is why strength or running, uh, particularly sprinting in the Marine Corps, we had to do the three mile. And then we have an 800 meter run in utilities. This is why these... Th anything that's super measurable, right? So I don't understand people that go into the gym and just like blast arms or, and then, you know, whatever. Now I'm not saying those things aren't fine after like the, the big lifts in my opinion, but I don't understand. I call it the lost boys workout, right? The lie we will go into the Marine gym and everyone's doing the lost boys workout. Some guys over here doing this, this guy's doing this, right? Which I'm not saying those things are bad, no, it's been, yeah, but I'm yeah. like, what's, what, what's the plan here? Oh, it's arms day. So you're just going to walk around and just grab random shit and do random things with it? Like, what are you doing? Yeah. I think it yeah. goes back to about the, uh, you know, I, I don't know if this video is talking about strength or what have you. We're talking about more than strength. You know, it's like yeah. uh, a, a foundation for the weight of you exercise. Uh, so I think uh, uh, talking about that, uh, there are three main types of um, trainer. OK, so what you've got, you've got the um, uh, the competitive athlete. Right. OK, who's only bothered about optimizing a certain performance. OK, whatever it is, whether a team athlete or, a, you know, a, a, an individual athlete. So you've got a competitive athlete. So they want to be on. They want to run faster, throw further, jump further, you know, uh, uh, more runs in NBA, uh, in NFL or whatever. So they're looking for a specific performance. So they're not bothered about having a balanced body or anything like that. They are only bothered about improving a specific performance. Um, so for instance, if you're a Tour de France rider, you're not bothered about the size of your arms. You're right. bothered about basically being quadriceps and heart and lungs. That's what you're bothered about. Okay? Right. You're not bothered about anything else. Uh, so there's that person. Secondly, you have the, the keep fit. Just the normal person who wants to keep fit, perhaps keep their weight down a little bit and stuff like that. It may That main person may not want to go to the gym. They may do a bit of gardening or they may go out for walks or, or whatever it is they want to do. So there's that person. But now we have this weird class of person, which is the growing class, okay, which is now the biggest class. The third person, which is like a combination of those things. So they're competitive amongst themselves and they're like the amateur sports person. So I would say it's people like CrossFitters. And people like that who are who are very competitive, they have high workloads, a bit like competitive athletes, but they're not really competitive athletes. Okay, so they're going to the gym and they're doing all sorts. So this is I don't know if that existed a century ago. It did, but now that is the main health and fitness market. The right. People do a bit of uh, you know jujitsu, or they do a bit of tennis, or they do, and they like they're really competitive but just amongst themselves. And so they, they're doing like semi-competitive athlete workouts. So they're the sort of, as I say, they're, they're like a third group of people. Uh, and I actually think, so they're like a gym rat, you know. Um, uh, and I think that they're the fastest growing, the biggest growing group. And probably those are the sort of people that are watching this video. It's not no, a think so. It's just no, a I... different group of people yeah. who are like yeah. sort of, Amateur professional, professional amateurs, you know, it's like. I think what we're seeing and probably for sure watching this video is, you know, because I dealt with brick and mortar gyms, Marines and people that were already interested in these sorts of things. And, you know, when I got on Twitter, 
you know, two years ago or something that kind of interact. It, I started talking to people I had never really talked to about strength training. Right. It was a whole do, new group for me. It was people that, you know, have other things that they're doing, um, uh, have other things that they're doing. And then they're, they're realizing that, you know, just walking around or gardening or something isn't enough. Right. And they're saying and and then when it happened and I don't know if this is just the nature of strength training um, or just in general, but they do become super competitive with themselves, right? They become uber competitive. And then they want to see, well, what's that person doing? What's this person doing? Right? This is one of the reasons the gyms have always worked for me. People come in because they know, have no idea how to get strong on their own. They come in, they pay for a high touch, high service thing. After a year, guess what? They're pretty freaking good. Why do they keep coming to get coached every single time? They know how to squat now. And I tell them my goal is to make you a, you know, a self you, you should be able to take care of yourself. You shouldn't need me to take care of you. And so I get them there, but they stay because they want to see what Mark's doing over there on the other, on the other platform. They want to see what that person's doing over there because that kind of keeps them going. And of course the coaching aspect of it's really hard helps, but, but they stay because it's, it becomes very competitive. So I think you're right. It is a whole new, I mean, the amount of programmers, you know, and these types of people that, I naturally fell into the weight room, right? It was just natural for me. But a lot of the people that I see doing this kind of stuff now, even going to CrossFit, some of these guys come in here and they're like a computer uh, science person or yeah. whatever, a doctor, something kind of strange. And they come in and they, they were like, well, I was doing CrossFit and I got injured. And I'm like, you were doing CrossFit? Like what? And it's like, yeah. So it's, it's an interesting point of, of yeah, that demographic. I'm and we're finally getting over in the US at least, the running 80s, right? Like my parents, I'm telling you, I grew up, if we wanted a new pair of shoes, my dad would give us 50 cents a mile. So we'd have to take our current shoes, <laughs> track how many miles, and then whatever, however many we got, we could go to the <laughs> Nike outlet and get a pair of shoes. I that, I hated running ever since then. I thought it was the worst <laughs> thing ever, right? Um, but, but that was the culture of me growing up. And in the 80s was, you know, uh, you know, just running. And, and I, people ask all the time, and this is, remember, I think sprinting completely different running. I'm talking jogging. People do that because it's easy. What do you have to do? You have to put on tennis shoes and walk outside, right? And guess what? Uh, if you want to stop, I just stop, right? And so, and, but they feel like they did something, right? They're hot, they're sweaty. They're like, oh yeah, I went for a jog. Oh, I can't. Well, the late anyway, 70s and the early 80s was when the big city center marathons started. Oh, okay. uh, and that tapped into all of that. So that was part of the evolution of long distance running. But people have always run long distance and, you know, as part of it, you know, the big city center marathons were the, as I said in my book, Anaerobics, was like the showcase for chronic self-harm. You know, right. it's like running miles and miles. We had athletes over here. There was a guy in the 70s who was an international athlete, in UK, Dave Bedford. And he got really good by training 200 miles a week by running 200 miles a week, week in, week out. Now, you have to be genetically be able to tolerate that because 99.99% yeah. of people just couldn't do that. It's impossible uh, without getting injured, you know, without like really getting the plods and without like really suffering. 200 no a week much, for how long? Yeah, 200 miles a week, forever, you know, for years. And then we had people like Ron Hill, who's got a clothing line, he's very well known in running, Ron Hill, who ran every day for 40 years. That was his thing. He even broke right. his leg and he ran. You know, he, he ran every day for like, I think it was like 38 years nonstop. Someone could fact right. check me. That, but it was like decades he ran. But he started up a clothing line, which is quite well known, Ron Hill. So he was an entrepreneur, but he right, literally right. ran every day. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I think we've gone past that point now. Obviously, people still do endurance runs. I don't have a problem with it. And the, what those endurance runners have done, they've said, oh, but we're naturally endurance athletes. Well, in a way, we are. But we don't train 200 miles a week. Okay, so it's the optimization. And that, that's something I was going to talk about later, but it's like comes up now. Yeah. And, you know, it's the optimization of the single metric, which can cause a problem. Okay. Totally. One is, the more you optimize one metric, you're probably harming another metric. So if you have a top of the range mount, uh, uh, racing bike, it's going to be crap on a, on a rocky road. You need a right. mountain bike. Right, okay. right, right. If you have a Formula One race car, it's going to be no good on a mud track. Right. You know, if, so the more you optimize, the less balanced your body becomes and the more uh, fragile it becomes in other areas. So this is what comes back to powerlifting. So I think that he, I said earlier on 
the strength has to be embedded. It was strength was embedded in my 800 meter training. Right. I think that strength has to be embedded in a holistic lifestyle. Okay. So uh, you said earlier, you touched on it, because strength has to be relevant to real life. It has right. to make you more capable in real life. Right. If it doesn't make you more capable in real life, it's not good. Right. So Again, and and strength, now, strength can be yeah. over-optimized as well, right? It, it, it can totally well, it can be because, it, Yeah. If, if, if it's, it's stronger, Yeah. Yep. No, I'm saying if the body mass is getting too big and these other things are happening, it's like, you know, I remember when I squatted 500 pounds. I squatted 500 pounds. I racked it. Second attempt in a competition. I went and walked out 515. I missed it. And I thought, I'm never squatting 500 again. I told myself I wanted to do it. I did it. I don't want to do it anymore. Because not that it wasn't fine. You can do it safely, all that stuff. But it was, it was, it was too far, right? I remember walking out that bar and thinking like, man. And people think this. People think this when I probably squat 400 pounds to this day, right? They probably, they view it as the same thing. And sure, it's not all relative, but what did I have to do to get up to 500? I had to take my body weight to 242. I had to do all of these things. And it was beyond the point yeah. of, okay, here's what your strength should be. Can you handle what life throws you? Okay. That's yeah. what I think your strength should be. And yeah. at some point, if you're deadlifting 315 for five, you can probably take any kick in the nuts from nature by then, right? Should you get it up to 400? Probably a lot of good mental things going on to continue. But yeah, I, the optimization of, of running and some, that's why strength. For me, it's like selling, you know, the guys that sell like, you know, baby oil or lotion, right? You can sell, you can sell it to a baby, you can sell it to your grandmother, you know, you, you tell everyone, hey, it's for everyone, and whether or not, forget if I believe in that, but for strength, it's, man, it really actually works for, for, for the sprinter, for the Marine in combat, for the, your grandmother. Um, yeah, it's, 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 I, it, it should be the foundation. You know, there's so much we could talk about. Uh, I think, um, uh, you know, we... Uh, uh, that goes back to what the main purpose of a gym is. Okay. Right. Oh, let, let me say let me say this first about examples of being an experiment of one, and also where you've got to try things out for yourself. And where and where also, if you have an elite coach or a coach coaching elite athletes, you don't necessarily say that's the best way to make an elite athlete or that's what have you, because there are thousands of different coaches and they're coaching thousands of different elite athletes. And they may have slightly different ways of their coaching. There are the foundations, you know, about overtraining, sleeping, recovery, adaptation and stuff. But what they're actually doing within that may be different for different people, for different athletes. So, for instance, I was saying that, uh, you know, when you look at like pathways, developmental pathways, uh, uh, a friend of mine was a national, it was a British champion, Taekwondo champion. Okay, Taekwondo is, you know, martial arts where you basically kick the shit out of each other and stuff like that. You don't really use your hands. It's like, you know, you're using your legs. So, um, uh, and what he did with his athletes, now this wouldn't be recommended in any, uh, by the federation, by the, uh, any form of, you know, uh, training schedule, by what have you, recommended training schedule. He used to take drawing pins onto the heels of his athletes you know, facing up so that if their heels landed on the ground, they would have a sharp reminder, literally, that their heels right. shouldn't be on the ground. OK, so he was a national. He was like the British champion, Taekwondo. And subsequently, he moved to Goa in India and he started up a, a federation, a Taekwondo federation over in India. OK, yeah. so he used this is going right back now. He used his own methods for producing athletes something that science wouldn't tell you wouldn't come up with he came up with it himself a real world example it's like how do i get athletes from not landing on their heels in taekwondo because most sports tennis squash everything you shouldn't be on your heels you right. always need to be loaded you need to be like a trigger you need to be right. ready to be able to move because as soon as you're on the heels you've then got to counter your own body weight before you can move right. you know and if you're back you need to go forwards so you right, always right. need to be prepared uh, to move quickly. This is why, you know, when you when you take a, when you return a serve in tennis, you're already jumping to return it. Before the ball comes, you're right. already unloading the weight, so your weight is not against you. So right. that was one thing he did. Now, a um, a lecturer at university, uh, he was a good lecturer, he taught us all about periodization, um, uh, micro, meso, and uh, macro cycles, and all the rest of it. 
And then he went to work for Tottenham Hotspur, which is a, a well-known uh, British football club, soccer club. Yeah, and I said, thank you, oh, thank oh. you for thank you yeah, for the soccer. American translation. Yeah, yeah. it's like the so. American speaker of foreign language. So I yeah, say yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm it chuffed. Yeah, I'm chuffed. yeah, and um, I said to him, "Do you use the same principles?" He said, "No, I don't. Don't use it at all. I I do an individual session, uh, individual uh, uh, routines for each athlete, for each football player." He said, "I ignore the periodization. I ignore the macro cycle. I ignore all that." But he was teaching us as like. Um, as a young, uh, as a degree student, the right. traditional ways of doing things, because he had to, because it was in the syllabus. So you right. have to teach the traditional way. But he'd gone beyond that and was then doing completely individualized sessions for individual footballers. I mean, so, I really like, I really like your in equals one, because I never thought about it like that. But I mean, it is for in terms of your own training, but like, man, I think that's really important for coaching, for coaches, because you know, it's people go on, you know, once they get their strength levels up, they do get stuck or stall and it, and, and it has to get more complex, right? At first, it's like very simple program. Yeah. And then as yeah. strength goes up, complexity arises, the strength increases. And I yeah. think, you know, what I try and teach coaches is, you know, so they say, okay, well, you know, this program written in this book says do 80% on this day and 90% over here and 72% over here for this many sets and this many reps. And it really can't be viewed like that. And this is what I have to tell people when they approach our services. I say it, it, it has to be individualized for you, particularly once strength gets up there. Now, if you're weak, novice, not true at all, everyone needs to do the same thing. But when it gets up there, right, and it doesn't mean elite level like you're an athlete, but when you're above the average of the average human being in strength, it, it comes down to you, right, to that person. And that's where, that's where for coaches, it's, you know, I, people want to come work and coach. And I say it like, it takes years to make a coach it takes years to make a good coach. I'm still learning all the time. Right. And, you know, after seeing it, cause then when you have in your, in your, in your storehouse, okay. I remember I had a woman in her forties and we did something. Let me try this kind of approach. Right. And it's not even like pull out that data and apply it. It's this was an approach that I took. Right. And you kind of learned that over time. But yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I think, uh, um, the N equals one doesn't mean that you don't go get stronger or you don't increase it. It means the way you do it right, is totally. like the way you get there may be different, may change and everything. You've right. still got the idea that you want to keep up your muscle mass or you want to keep up your strength. But as you start getting better and better, it's more difficult to mine that. So you have to be clever with how you can mine that extra right. strength. That's it. Right. It doesn't mean you don't do squats or it doesn't mean you forget about being stronger because that's not important. I mean, I can give you an example. I mean, I was um, a coach to a friend of mine who was a, uh, a national level 400 meter hurdler. And uh, the difficulty was because he was a 400 meter hurdler, he had to do like this multi dimensions. He had to do various, you know, different exercises, different training that a 400 meter hurdler did. He needed to do rhythm training for hurdles, he needed to do strength training, flexibility you know, intervals, endurance runs, hills, circuits, all that sort of stuff. Right. But as he got better and better and better, it was really difficult to mine those things concurrently. Uh, yeah, together at the same time. Concurrently? Yeah. My yeah, English. yeah, yeah, concurrently. Yeah, yeah, at the same time. Really difficult. So I said, here, let's just try this. Okay. So we said, we're going to forget everything because I've read in some Russian training book, which was great about the, the concept of uh, univariative, uh, no, variative unidirectional training, which means that you've got one goal and you use different means to get that goal, but you've got okay. one goal. Okay, right. so we said, what we're going to do over the next couple of weeks, the next few weeks, you're going to forget about running, circuits, hills. You're just going to concentrate on strength. Okay, because a hurdler takes so many strides between each hurdle. Okay, the weaker hurdler takes 17 strides between a hurdle, whereas the stronger hurdler takes 14 or 15 or even 13 strides between. Yeah, there's a, there's a height thing as well, but basically the stride length comes from force application. Force on the production ground. on the ground. It doesn't come yep. from stretching your legs. It comes right. from force application on the ground. Okay, that's the same as acceleration. It's the same as if you want to, everything being equal, a jet with a greater thrust has got better acceleration and goes faster. Yeah, so the stride length is force application on the ground. So I thought, okay, 
I can't get you any fitter as such, but I can get you stronger. OK, because because your strength training has been embedded in your hurdles, it's been clipped. OK, right. you haven't been able to maximize your strength. So right. we took, we'll take a few weeks out. We'll maximize your strength. Now, he hadn't he was like 30 and he hadn't run a PB for about five years. And he was a bit despondent because he thought he still had a bit more in the tank and more to prove. Yeah. And uh, so we did a few weeks of pure strength training, which basically involved deads and squats. It based around deads and squats. He used to love doing pull-ups and stuff like that. He said large lats and big backers. No, forget about that. You don't need big lats to yeah, be a 400-meter yeah, yeah. hurdler. Yeah. So he concentrated on that. And he got his squat up. I forget what the figures were. And he got his deadlift up. And then I said, what you need to do now, it is so taxing. You need to spend basically 10 to 14 days doing hardly anything because your body needs time to super compensate. It needs time to adapt. So he's done so much strength training that his fatigue levels have gone up like that. His capability of his body's gone down like that because his body's starting to suffer now. So he's right. actually, he's got stronger. Then he started getting weaker, okay, because he's doing so much training. Yeah, and then, he, but his fatigue levels go up. So what, you have time off and then you go back to baseline and then you super compensate. So what happened? Okay, because he was scared that he would lose everything, he went back to full training. Okay, like while he was still legs, while he while okay. he was still down here, and while he was still at the you know either either at the baseline or below the baseline, so he hadn't super got he didn't allow him to, himself to super compensate. So he went to a race and it was like shit. It was like a second and a half, which is like a you know like a completely different race. You right, know, right, when right. you're running 52, 53 and a half is a completely different athlete. You know, for four hundred right. So whatever, and I said, listen, keep the faith. What you need to do is need to spend more time. And lo and behold, okay, I said, don't do anything about from just a little bit of tempo running, bit of stretching, lots of right, sleep, right, right, nice right. nutrition, don't overeat. So he then did the what South happened? of England. He did the South of England. I couldn't make it. I was at the track. And uh, he did the South England of England Championships in Crystal Palace, which is a well-known venue for athletics in the UK. Yeah. And then he phoned me. He said, oh, guess what? He said, I won. So I won the South of England Champs and I got a PB. Okay, 51.9. Now, I know this is anecdotal, but I know it's because he's put, he, what he did, he did two things. He concentrated on something which had been suppressed. And, he con and this was strength. And I thought strength is where he, and he said himself, in the last two hurdles, he used less strides right. between the hurdles. So he actually, his strength, like, he didn't do strength endurance. He right. did strength. So his submax was better. Right. Okay, because his max went up, so his sub max was better. So he spent he had two hurdles, which he he did one less drive per hurdle. Okay, and that took off about 0.8 of a second, something like seven meters. He was faster by seven meters. Right, right. Okay. Now you wouldn't be able to do that all year round because it's what goes back to the lag effect. If he did that for a year, all those other aspects would start degrading because sure. it depends on having that lag effect hanging right. around for a while. Of his right. speed, endurance, of his speed, and all the rest of it. Okay, so we use strength. I could talk so long about this, and I but see I mean, all sorts of, you know. No, I'm just, no, I was just gonna say, I, and I think it's so true in athleticism, but it's really just so true for for everyone that we're talking to in just life, right? It's the most trainable aspect that we can change, right? We talk about the power formula and how do we make that go up? What's the number one thing I can change? F, force production, right? It's the most it's the most trainable aspect that has carry over into everything. And you're right for the athlete. And I think, here's what I think, Guru. We're at an hour yeah. and a half. I think we need to do this weekly. Uh, perhaps we do because we can speak yeah. about different aspects. Yeah, uh, yeah. I, think we, we I, want to, I want to touch on something very quickly. Yeah, yeah go for it. Much, very quickly, which perhaps we can take over, is yeah. the the confusion between power and strength, okay, yeah. and where power comes from and where strength comes from. Now, I, I'm pretty uh, adamant about this, okay, because I see a lot of bullshit on all everywhere, and I, I've I've read power books, how to increase your power. They most of them are they've got like twenty five. They've got two hundred five hundred exercises. They've got med ball exercises. They've got jumping this and do whatever with like 30% of your body weight, you know, increase your power. It, 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 it kills me because most of it's complete rubbish. Okay. The thing is for a novice, if you do that, you'll improve. Right. Okay. Because as we said before, it's a novice effect. 
So all if right. I start doing power exercises, I'm going to improve. I'm going to get stronger. I'm going to get more sure. powerful. What have you? But we're not talking about. You're actually about probably this. just getting stronger. Well, and yeah, you're getting displaying as power because you're exactly. so detrained. But continue. So going from my notes, so strength strength training is power training. Right. Power training is not power training. Neither is it strength training. Okay. Sports like sprinting uh, depend on rate of force development (RFD) as yeah, so a rate of force development. And I know this has been in the two mentioned in the two-factor model, the rate right. of force development. Power training is trying to increase the rate. The rate is basically very difficult to increase because it's basically genetically determined. Quickness and the reflexes and your Golgi tendon organs and all the rest of it is basically genetically determined. If you want to increase your rate of force development, i.e. power, which is strength over time, don't increase your rate, increase your force. Right. OK. And you do that by basic strength because rate is very difficult to improve. So whereas force can be increased a lot, I can get twice as stronger, three times right. stronger on my bench press or twice as stronger on my squat. I can't get twice as fast. You know, right. my, I can't. My nervous impulses can't travel down my mind. So voluntarily, your I ability. Might, your ability to recruit muscle neurons is set at birth. I'm sorry. So very, the, the, you know, the only I've thing you before, can do is increase the yeah, strength. I said before, if you want a more agile team, sack the lot of them and get in more agile athletes. Right, okay? right. <laughs> because if you've got a non-agile team, no amount of agility training is going to make them agile. It'll make them right. slightly less worse. Right, okay, right. It won't slightly make them less agile. Worse. Slightly less worse, but it's not yeah. going to make them agile. And for someone who's already fit and lean, it's not going to do anything. Right. And also, if you need to teach movement patterns to someone, they're not the sort of person who should be in your elite squad. Right. Because I, I really <laughs> do think that... No, you know, athletes, you, athletes look and do, yeah. right? I have an NFL guy I coach, right? I got really excited. Big time pro bowler hit me up hit for some equipment and said, hey, like I see, I see you squatting and deadlifting, you know, more than me how do you do this and i said well hey man i'd like love to show you right and so we hopped on zoom one time and we did a session and it he knew how to like he was squatting right and he was doing it all wrong and i was like do this this and this and then he was doing it all right and then in between the next session i said next time we're going to deadlift and i sent him a video i was like watch this first and i go in and he deadlifts perfect and we do like a second session then he goes hey man i like, so we don't have to coordinate. I think I kind of got the movements down. Why don't you just tell me how much to go up each time? And I was like, fair, you do have the movements down. You'd 100%. I mean, he learned it instantly. I mean, instantly. I was like, you do have the movements down. I was like, but I can only tell you how much to go up if I see from time to time for bar speed, right? Uh, but, but I, and that's really, I've worked with athletes. That's the only like actual athlete, you know, that I've been like, wow. I don't yeah. have to teach him anything. He was squatting yeah. completely wrong because yeah. no one had told him to do this other way. Yeah. Now he's squatting completely yeah. right. Yeah. Well, look. I'm looking. At, I'm looking. I'm just a couple of minutes. I'm looking at my notes because I, yeah. I just want to mention a few other things about that. Yeah, yeah. And so, people have to have a problem. They think that power means that you need to be fast. Um, um, power without strength is not power. It's just quickness. Okay? Right. So you could be quick but not powerful. So I, you can be like five stone and not powerful, but be very quick because you've got quick reflexes. So you're like a power little is, is strength displayed quickly. Uh, power is strength is fast strength. That's what power right. is. Yeah, yeah. And the point is, it doesn't mean you have to move the object or the bar quickly because it's a rate of force development, even if there's no movement. So right. if I'm if I'm lifting a, a deadlift, a barbell or I'm doing bench, or I'm doing squats. It's not how quickly I'm squatting it, it's how quickly I'm applying the power. Right. So if I apply power to a 100K bar, to a 220 bar, it will move a certain speed. If I apply the same amount of strength to a bar twice as much, it will hardly move, but I'm still applying effort. So power is a combination of fast effort and strength. The resulting movement it's whatever. It doesn't really matter. Right, but people right. think the power means you need to move things quickly. No, you don't. You need to apply big force quickly. 
quickly. That's what you need to do. This is why power lifters are doing the three big lifts. Olympic lifters are doing the cleans and the snatch. Power lifters are doing the three big lifts. Okay. And I know there are power lifters who've gone over to Olympic lifting. Okay. And how they do it. Yeah, I know myself. And people think they were different. They're not. Because you then, have to so, be strong to be an Olympic lifter. This this is the problem with the Olympic sports. This is why the U.S. is so terrible at it. As you know, no one they 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 don't have them deadlift heavy. They don't have them squat heavy it's because it's ridiculous. They spend all this time building power. It's like if you'd build that guy's deadlift, his clean would go way up, right? Or his squat, or what? I mean, it's just to me, to us, it makes so much sense. I don't know how there's such a big. We should That's actually probably we actually should probably that. say we should probably say real quick because I find all the yeah. time people don't know this. There's two sports. There's powerlifting and there's weightlifting. In America, we call it Olympic weightlifting. Powerlifting, squat, bench, deadlift, Olympic lifting or weightlifting. The sport is the snatch from ground to overhead in one movement and the clean and jerk, ground to the shoulders and then applied up overhead. Um, so those are the two things. Which I know, lift, which I know you yeah. know, but yeah. I mean, if you can deadlift 300 uh, kilos, 660 pounds, okay, you can you can uh, power clean or you can clean like, you know, two thirds of that. Okay? Who has? But who if has you can't, bigger, yeah. yeah. Who has the bigger power clean? The 600 pound deadlifter or the 300 pound deadlifter? It's ridiculous. I mean, I learned this myself years ago in the gym that when right. my dead and squ- I know it's an N equals one, but I'm, I'm like, this is experience over years that whenever my dead and uh, squat went up, my power clean and power snatch went up. Okay, even with the same body weight, I just got it went up all the time. Uh, my power clean and dead and and uh, snatch would never go up if my squat. Uh, notwithstanding that you've got to learn technique. Okay, you're, yeah, you're clean. It, it, it is it is yeah. very technique dependent. So you have to learn technique. I understand yeah. it. It's the same yeah. as you say about the hip thing with a jig shoulder press. If right, you right, learn right. the right technique and you have the right groove and you're using gravity and a certain mass property, right. you can lift more. Right. even with the same strength so we're not right. talking about technique or skill which is right. another thing Assuming if you that, are, yeah, yeah if you were already skilled and technically good at clean and uh, uh snatch the way you're going to make it uh, you're going to increase that is by increasing your gross strength increasing your gross strength this also goes back to another thing which we'll have to talk about later is your gross strength is your specific strength and right. that the people don't really, I hear all this rubbish in sprinting about gait cycles and because it's like one legged, you need to train one leg, you know, you need to this. No, no, no. A specific, specific training is meant to produce a specific outcome. Outcome. That's all you're bothered about. It doesn't have to look like the movement you're doing in the sport. It may do, but it doesn't have to. So this is why, regardless of what people say, when you squat 50% more, it will cut across everything you do. Okay, it will cut across everything you do. You say, oh yeah, but that sport, backflips, running up a ladder, sprinting, whatever it is, that doesn't look like a squat. I should throw a heavier baseball in order to throw a baseball faster, right? Uh, listen, when we chucked <laughs> medicine, exactly. When we chucked medicine balls for fun, and when we right. jumped the front of the track, the ones who had the highest relative squats could do it more. Right. The ones yeah, who are stronger could try it further. No amount of me throwing medicine balls, notwithstanding the technique, would make me get faster at throwing a medicine ball. Right. Okay. Right. But if I improve my back strength and my leg strength and my glutes and hands, it would get strong. I would be able to throw a medicine ball faster. Okay. If you want to increase your tennis serve, if you want to have more power in your tennis serve, you have to have the right technique, obviously. Right, But if you can start squatting and deadlifting, because there's a kinetic chain, um, type, a martial arts, kickboxing, shot putting, long jump, the kinetic chain is from the ground up. It's from the ground. So it all comes from your lower body. Right. It comes from your lower body. You increase the strength of your lower body and your back. Even a throwing sport will be better, where you, right, throw, right. A baseball, where you throw a baseball. And it, as like it says in two-factor authentication, oh, but you should learn to throw a baseball, you know, which is like 50% heavier. That doesn't help. One, because it changes the movement pattern. Now the mechanics are screwed. Oh, the, oh, the mechanics are absolutely screwed. Yep. But if you increase your squat and dead, your baseball will be faster. Yes, you need a whippy arm. So whatever you do, you mustn't, you know. Um, uh, but this is this is back to your whip. 
You know, yeah, but this is back to the and keep that width. You'll get you'll be faster baseball thrower. And this is back to the why the general strength training and the way that we advocate for it is because you're not just isolating, you know, the bicep or the hamstring, but you're getting the tendons and the ligaments over joints so that when you are doing that, you know, it's 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 the I the thing I always ask, especially when I have the young kids, I'm like, why do baseball players take steroids? It isn't because it makes them swing the bat better. It's because they get stronger, right? And then, yeah. you know, the outcomes it increases the sport or whatever the case is. Yeah, there's one anecdote. I don't know how long we've been on for, uh, Grant. One forty-five. Hey, listen. Let me put one anecdote for. Okay. Now, Final uh, a one. friend of mine who was a university lecturer. He was. It was built like Adonis, basically. He was six foot four, yeah. uh, so one ninety-five like centimeters, like you. He was Adonis, yeah, like yeah, you. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but we, and he was a, <laughs> an international shot putter. Yeah. He okay. eventually, he, once he, he finished career, he started playing rugby, professional rugby as well. Now he was six foot four and he was two fifty pounds. So what's that, about eighteen stone? And he was a shot putter. He was an eighteen meter plus shot putter, which in world standard is whatever. But it's like very very. You have to be super strong to be able to uh, shot or put. You know, uh, put a shot rather fifty nine feet. You have got to be strong. Right. Okay. He was one of the fastest thirty meter runners in the country. He also had one of the longest standing long jumps in the, in the country. So he could keep up 25, 30 meters of the top the best sprinters in the world he had a standing long jump as long as any olympic athlete as long as any olympic weightlifter or a, or a sprinter or power athlete it's really interesting and he told me this he said mark he said when i went to my first competition commonwealth games i competed at the commonwealth games regardless my friend abby six foot four 250 pounds immensely powerful okay super fast great long jump he said i've got to the commonwealth championship and what I sound found, we had six foot nine athletes who weighed 320 pounds. He said, for the first time in my life, I felt like a midget. He said that really messed with my psychology because he went from being a big man, very strong in normal society, to going to this international competition where the guys were 70 pounds heavier than him, stronger than him. And uh, could chuck the, the shot put three meters more, like nine, ten feet more. Wow. And was six, you know, like five, six, seven inches taller. He said, for the first time in my life, I felt like a pit squeak. Now, I'm telling you, no amount of power training would have made him be able to compete at that level. What he would have needed to have done was increase his strength. Okay. Of course, he'd already almost optimized his strength. He needed right. to increase his body weight and his right. strength. Right. No amount of extra power training power. of like different weight shot puts of medicine ball of jumping under a bar of 30 40 percent his body weight would have Bigger made, he needed gross strength yeah. to be able to compete at that international level. So that's yeah, that's we, an anecdote, but this is coming from an elite, you know, a, a top athlete. Oh, yeah, yeah, no, we could do a whole thing on gr gross strength. I think that's a that's that's a good point.